Today we're going to talk about the for each method, specifically what it does and how it does it. So for each executes a provided callback function once for each element in the array. So for each's callback has a very similar function signature to maps. So we still get the element, the index, and the array. So really the main difference between for each and map is that the return value of for each's callback is not used. And that really lines up with the whole purpose of for each, which is really about the side effects. And we'll get into that in a moment here. Now here we have some chained methods off of our people array. So first we're filtering and then we're going to map it to something else. Now, even though we have empty functions in each of those, the functions are passing, don't do anything. Take a look at what our return value equals. So we get a return value of an array, specifically an empty array. Now watch what happens if we change this to for each. Change that to for each, we'll save and run this. Look at our return value. Our return value is undefined. So that really highlights one of the big differences between for each and map. So because for each returns undefined, you can't use it in chaining operations the same way that you would map. We mentioned that the main purpose of for each is for the side effects. And some examples of that would be mutating external state. For example, here we have an external count variable and inside of our for each callback, we're conditionally incrementing that. Another example would be interacting with APIs like the console log API or network IO like fetch or local storage in the browser. Another example would be direct DOM manipulation. Now, an important thing about for each is that you, the developer, you don't have any control over early termination, over stopping the iteration early. So here we have a simplified version of our for each callback. So we've simplified it just to the mutating external state side effect and the logging side effect. Now, if we run this code, you'll see that we get our logs for each element in our original array and we get our log for the mutated external state. So we have count of one. Now, say if you try to do something like add a break statement here, notice right away that we get a red underline underneath it and this error jump target cannot cross function boundary. So that's telling us that we can't use it here. Now, if we tried to ignore that and say run it anyway, we're gonna get a syntax error, illegal break statement. So yeah, we can't use it. We can't use a break statement to end a for each iteration early. Now, if you do need to end the iteration early, don't use for each, it's not the right tool here. So you would use something like a traditional for loop or maybe a for of loop. Now, there is one exception to this. While you can't use a break statement to end a for each iteration early, you could technically throw an error here. So for example, if we throw new error, and let's say end iteration early, we could do this. But notice here right away that we get this yellow underline over this line, unreachable code detected. Now, why is it doing that? Well, because once we enter this conditional, we immediately throw an error. So we're never gonna get to that line of code to execute it. Now, if we run this, you can see that we do indeed end the iteration early, but we do it by throwing an error, right? So there's our error, end iteration early. Don't get the person logs nor the count log. So yeah, I mean, this does technically do it, but in my opinion, this is a really hacky approach to accomplishing this. And if you need early termination, there are better approaches for doing this, like the for loop or the for of loop. So that's it for this introduction to the array for each method. It's primarily used for side effects, things like mutating external state, interacting with APIs, DOM manipulation, things like that. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, tell a friend about this, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.